this other galaxy in another universe would be invisible, yet it would have mass. That's exactly what dark matter is. Have you ever wondered what most of the universe is actually made of? Believe it or not, only 4% of the universe is what we can see and interact with. The rest is a mysterious substance called dark matter. Dark matter is massive, it has gravity, but it's invisible. It has no interactions with light or the electromagnetic force. You might think you understand what dark matter means, but there's a whole lot more to uncover about the true nature of this substance. As Kaku says, dark matter is the cutting edge of science. Dark matter is the cutting edge of science. Some people think that maybe it's a higher vibration of the string. We're beginning to see new developments made in this field a lot more often now. So let's dive into why dark matter is not what you think it is. How do we know dark matter exists? The idea of dark matter might seem like a recent discovery, but the observations hinting at its existence go way back. We're talking almost a hundred years ago. Back in 1927, a Dutch astronomer named Jan Oort was studying our home galaxy, the Milky Way. Remember, galaxies were a pretty new concept then. Edwin Hubble's famous paper proving the existence of another galaxy, Andromeda, had only come out two years before. So, Oort was on the cutting edge, trying to understand our own galactic neighborhood. One of his big discoveries was that the Milky Way actually rotates. Pretty cool, right? He figured this out by studying the velocities of nearby stars, even though he was right in the thick of it all within the galaxy itself. But then he noticed something weird. When Oort looked at how fast these stars were moving and compared it to the amount of visible matter in the galaxy, something didn't add up. It was like the stars were moving way faster than they should be, according to the laws of physics. Stars in a galaxy kind of orbit the center, like planets around the sun. These orbits are usually close to circles, and anything moving in a circle needs a force pulling it inwards. Think about swinging a ball on a string. The faster you spin it, the tighter you have to grip the string to keep it from flying off. Gravity acts like that invisible string for stars and galaxies. The point is, the faster something moves in a circle, the stronger the inward pull needs to be. Well, Oort realized the stars in the Milky Way were moving too quickly for the gravity of all the visible matter to hold them in their orbits. By all rights, the galaxy should have been flying apart. So, to make his observations fit with the known laws of physics, the Milky Way would have needed to be twice as massive as what Oort's measurements suggested. Now keep in mind, this was all happening in 1932. Measuring the mass and movement of a galaxy, especially when you're stuck right inside it, is no easy feat. There was a chance his measurements weren't perfect. Still, even though no one was super alarmed by this discrepancy at the time, it was one of the first hints that something mysterious was at play in the universe. This unseen thing, whatever it was, seemed to be exerting a gravitational pull strong enough to hold the Milky Way together. This little discrepancy would eventually lead us down the path to dark matter. Fritz Zwicky, a pioneer of dark matter. Things got even more interesting the following year. Fritz Zwicky was a Swiss astronomer working at the California Institute of Technology. He was looking at a giant gathering of galaxies called the Coma Cluster, way out there, about 300 million light years away. It was almost like a cosmic city with over a thousand galaxies all hanging out together, bound by gravity in the constellation Coma Berenices. Zwicky did something similar to what Oort did with the Milky Way, but on a much grander scale. He looked at all the galaxies in the Coma Cluster, estimated their mass, and then measured how fast they were zooming around. But there was something kind of crazy going on. When he compared the galaxy's motion energy to the gravity holding them together, there was a massive mismatch. Just like with the Milky Way, the galaxies in the Coma Cluster seemed to be moving way too fast for the gravity of all the visible matter to hold them in place. By all accounts, the cluster should have been flying apart. But here it was, a giant, stable clump of galaxies defying the laws of physics as we understood them. This was another major clue that something unseen was lurking out there in the universe, influencing gravity in a big way. This unseen mass in the coma cluster was the big mystery. Zwicky's calculations 
suggested there had to be about 400 times more invisible stuff than what he could actually see. Fritz Zwicky was decades ahead of his time, and that's why he graded on the astronomical community. But you know, he was right. Now, Zwicky and the other astronomers of that era weren't quite sure what this invisible stuff was. Maybe there were unseen galaxies out there, or giant clouds of gas we couldn't detect. But whatever it was, Zwicky knew it was important. He even gave it a name, Dunkel Materie, which translates to dark matter in German. Zwicky's estimate of dark matter being 400 times more than ordinary matter was pretty high. Modern science has refined that number to be a bit smaller, but that doesn't take away from his groundbreaking discovery. Zwicky's work on the Coma Cluster was a major piece of the puzzle that led us to the theory of dark matter. Vera Rubin's revolutionary discovery. Fast forward to today, and we estimate that a whopping 90% of the mass in the Coma Cluster is dark matter with only 10% being the regular stuff we can see. That 400 times number was a big overestimate, but hey, science is all about refining our understanding. Those early observations by Oort and Zwicky were the first whispers of dark matter, but the trail went quiet for a while after the 1930s. Astronomers were aware of the discrepancies, but it wasn't until the 1970s that things really picked up again. Vera Rubin, an American astronomer, faced a whole different set of challenges. Back then, many universities wouldn't even accept women into doctoral programs. And on top of that, juggling a family with research in the most competitive fields of the day was no easy feat. So Dr. Rubin decided to tackle a topic that was considered safe and non-controversial, how fast galaxies rotate. She started with our closest big neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. It's massive easy to find in the sky, even if a bit faint to the naked eye. It's like a giant fuzzy blob compared to the tiny dot of the full moon. All right, let's get a bit more technical here. Remember when we talked about Oort's work in the 1930s? We mentioned stars orbit galaxies in circles, held in place by gravity. That's true, but things get a little more complex when you consider the speed of stars at different distances from the galactic center. The idea is that as a star's orbit gets bigger, the mass that affects its motion changes. In the center of the galaxy, a star is surrounded by a bunch of other stars, and their gravity kind of cancels each other out. So, only the stars closest to the center really matter for that star's motion. On the other hand, for stars way out in the galactic suburbs, the mass of the entire galaxy comes into play. This might seem obvious, but it's important to understand when we talk about how fast things move in a galaxy. Okay, so the situation isn't quite as simple as a single force acting on all the stars. You know how stars further out feel the pull of the entire galaxy's mass, while those closer to the center only feel the influence of their immediate neighbors? This means the strength of gravity they experience changes depending on their location. The good news is, figuring out how fast a star should be orbiting based on its distance from the center is actually a pretty manageable calculation. It's one of those rare cases where you don't even need fancy calculus, just some basic physics knowledge. We won't delve into the nitty-gritty details here, but trust me, it's doable. Here's the gist. Stars near the galactic center feel the pull of less mass, so they move slower. Conversely, stars way out on the outskirts feel the entire galaxy's mass, so they have to zip around faster to stay in their orbits. The speed kind of peaks near the edge, and then trails off again for those straggler stars hanging out beyond the main galactic disk. So it's slow in the center, fast in the middle, and slow again way out on the fringes. That's the basic picture of how gravity dictates a star's orbital speed within a galaxy. So this is where Vera Rubin's work comes in. She wasn't revolutionizing the field, she just wanted to understand how fast galaxies rotate. So she made a plan, measured the speed of stars at different distances from the center of their galaxy, and compare it to what we'd expect based on the visible mass distribution. Everything seemed to check out near the center of the galaxy. Prediction matched observation. But things got interesting when Rubin looked at the outskirts. According to the calculations, the stars way out there should be moving much slower, but that wasn't the case. They were cruising along at pretty much the same speed as the stars closer to the edge. There are a few ways to explain this discrepancy, but one possibility is pretty darn intriguing each galaxy might be shrouded in a giant cloud of invisible matter. Remember Zwicky and his dark matter? 
Ruben's observations were suggesting he might be onto something big. And she wasn't just looking at one galaxy, mind you. Dr. Rubin studied many galaxies, and the same story kept playing out. This wasn't a fluke. Something invisible seemed to be influencing the motion of stars across the board. Basically, stars on the fringes of most galaxies were moving way too fast for gravity alone to explain it. Rubin's work is considered some of the strongest evidence we have for dark matter. She received many accolades, including the National Medal of Science and a bunch of honorary doctorates. They even renamed the lab housing the powerful Large Synoptic Survey Telescope in her honor. It's now the NSF Vera C. Rubin Observatory, set to be one of the most productive astronomy facilities ever when it starts operations in 2022. One thing that many people find surprising is that Dr. Rubin never received a Nobel Prize in physics for her groundbreaking work. It's definitely a missed opportunity, but sadly, Nobel Prizes can't be awarded posthumously. Her contributions to our understanding of the universe are undeniable. And even without a Nobel Prize, Vera Rubin's legacy as a pioneer in dark matter research is secure. What gravitational lensing shockingly helped us discover. The observations of Oort, Zwicky, and Rubin all point in the same direction. Galaxies with stars moving way too fast for the visible matter to explain. But that's just one piece of the dark matter puzzle. Let's talk about another key player in the story. Arthur Eddington. This ingenious astronomer used a solar eclipse to demonstrate that light bends around massive objects like the sun. This phenomenon, called gravitational lensing, is like a cosmic magnifying glass. Think of a massive galaxy far, far away with another galaxy much closer to us in between. The gravity of the closer galaxy acts like a giant lens, bending the light coming from the distant one. Some of the light travels in a straight line and gets absorbed by the closer galaxy. But some of the light gets bent by the closer galaxy's gravity, and that bent light ends up reaching Earth. This bending creates a distorted image of the faraway galaxy. Now, if everything lines up just right, the two galaxies are perfectly in our line of sight. Then here's the cool thing we see on Earth. The closer galaxy looks normal, but with a bright ring around it. This ring, called an Einstein ring, by the way, is actually a warped image of the distant galaxy behind it, bent by the closer one's gravity. The first perfect ring was spotted in 1998, which was a major moment for dark matter research. Sometimes, the alignment isn't quite perfect, and instead of a complete ring, astronomers see a curved arc of light. They've observed quite a few of these incomplete Einstein rings, but my favorite has a rather dull official name, SDSSJ, 1038 plus 4849. Thankfully, it also has a much cooler nickname, the Smiling Face Gravitational Lens. So, two giant galaxies act like a cosmic magnifying glass, bending the light from an even more distant galaxy behind them. The two closer galaxies look like eyes, and the distorted, stretched-out image of the most distant one creates a smile. It's a pretty neat example of how gravity can play tricks on light. This same phenomenon can even happen on much larger scales, not just with individual galaxies, but with entire clusters of galaxies. The gravity of a nearby cluster can warp the light coming from galaxies way beyond it. The visual signature isn't as dramatic as a perfect Einstein ring, or as fun as a smiling face. But astronomers can still detect these faint, distorted arcs of light from distant galaxies. It's all thanks to the bending power of gravity, acting like a giant cosmic lens across the universe. The amount of distortion caused by a galaxy cluster directly relates to its mass. This is where things get really interesting for dark matter. Just think about looking at this phenomenon through the lens of the universe's matter budget. Two key questions arise. One, how much mass is needed to create the observed distortion? And two, does the total visible mass in the cluster, when we add it all up, match the amount needed for the distortion? The answer, quite often, is a clear no. There simply isn't enough stuff we can see with telescopes to explain the bending of light we're observing. This is where it gets fascinating. Astronomers can leverage a phenomenon called redshift distortion, coupled with their understanding of the universe's expansion, to estimate the distances of both the nearby and faraway galaxy clusters. This allows them to build a kind of cosmic map charting the distribution of mass across the universe. The crucial point is using gravitational lensing as a tool we see significantly more mass in the universe than what our telescopes can directly detect. 
This unseen mass, whatever it may be, is a prime suspect in the ongoing dark matter mystery. Dark matter, in exact terms. So the big question, what exactly is dark matter? Here's the honest truth. We don't have all the answers yet. But scientists generally believe it's a type of matter that doesn't interact with electromagnetism or the nuclear forces that bind atoms together. The best guess right now is that dark matter only feels the pull of gravity. As for its form, well, that's up for debate. A common image is a giant invisible gas permeating the universe, swirling around galaxies and clusters. Think of it like invisible clouds or even a ghostly shroud, countless subatomic particles, each with a mass a few times that of a proton. The reality is, we don't know for sure what these individual dark matter particles look like. But one thing is pretty certain, there's a whole lot of it out there. Estimates suggest there's about five times more dark matter than the matter that makes up all the atoms in the universe. Five times more. That's a pretty big statement considering we're still confused about the exact nature of dark matter. It's a bit of a cosmic mystery. But hey, that's what makes science so exciting. Possible explanations for dark matter. So, is dark matter the real deal? The evidence suggests very strongly that it is, but science thrives on definitive proof. Let's use a cool metaphor first introduced by a physics professor named Stacy McGaw. He came up with this analogy to help us visualize what we know and what's still up in the air. Imagine a tree of mystery, and the roots represent what we know for sure. Thanks to Oort, Zwicky, and Rubin, we know astronomical objects move way faster than gravity alone can explain, given the amount of visible matter. We also know that gravitational lensing observations show more bending of light than what our current understanding of physics allows for. There are even more observations that point to the same thing, a discrepancy between what we think we know and what we actually see. These confirmed observations are like the strong roots of our mystery tree. Dark matter is a leading explanation for this discrepancy, but hold on, there might be more to the story. What else do we know? Well, sticking with the tree metaphor, these roots branch out into a trunk, which then splits into branches. All right, so the tree of mystery keeps branching out. One branch represents the possibility that there's something new to learn about physics itself. Maybe our understanding of how forces and acceleration work needs a revision. Perhaps general relativity, our current theory of gravity, isn't the whole story on these massive cosmic scales. The other main branch suggests there's unseen mass out there. This could be more of the kind of matter we already know, like dead stars, cold gas clouds, or even undiscovered black holes. Alternatively, it could be some entirely new type of exotic matter, something we've never observed before. This metaphor even allows for further exploration. Imagine the branches further dividing into limbs, twigs, and eventually leaves. Each leaf could represent a specific solution, a brand new theory of gravity, the existence of heavier neutrino cousins, and so on. Now, the most intuitive answer might be that there's simply more normal matter lurking around undetected. However, if there were giant clouds of gas, we'd likely have some kind of clue. They might emit light, radio waves, infrared radiation, or some other form of detectable energy. We've explored the possibility of more ordinary matter hiding out there. But telescopes haven't revealed massive gas clouds, and astronomers have factored those in already. Another idea was a swarm of unseen compact objects, like black holes or brown dwarfs. The strategy was to observe distant stars and see if these compact objects pass in front, dimming their light like an eclipse. But here's the twist. The expectation was actually for the stars to brighten briefly. This brightening would be similar to the effect seen in an Einstein ring. Astronomers in the early 1990s conducted this experiment and observed the stars brightening as predicted. However, the data also showed there weren't enough of these unseen objects to account for the missing mass. So that wasn't the answer either. Scientists even considered exotic possibilities like subatomic particles called neutrinos. The theory was that a huge number of neutrinos were created during the Big Bang. However, neutrinos have very little mass and zip around at incredibly high speeds. If they were the dark matter culprit, their high velocity would significantly impact how galaxies formed and evolved over billions of years. As a result, the universe wouldn't look the way it does today. So we can also cross cosmic neutrinos off the dark matter suspect list. Modified Newtonian equations cluing us in. 
So for decades, astronomers have been on the hunt for dark matter, that mysterious stuff that seems to hold galaxies together. They've checked all the usual suspects, regular matter, exotic forms of matter, but nothing seems to fit the bill. This begs the question, what if the problem isn't the matter itself, but our understanding of gravity? Now, this idea of modified gravity might sound a bit out there, and the evidence for it isn't quite as strong as dark matter. But there are some compelling reasons to take a closer look. Before we dive into those, though, let's talk about some of the proposed tweaks to the laws of gravity. The most famous example comes from Israeli physicist Mordecai Bro back in 1981. He was studying Vera Rubin's work on galaxy rotation, which showed stars at the edges whirling way too fast for normal gravity to keep them in orbit. Something strange was definitely going on. So the key player here is Newton's second law of motion, which you might remember from physics class as F equals sine ma. It basically says that the force on something is equal to its mass times its acceleration. This law has been put through the ringer in countless physics labs by students and professionals alike. Now, Milgram wondered how to tweak this law to explain some weird things we see happening with how galaxies rotate. His idea? Well, he figured Newton was on the right track for big forces and accelerations, but maybe for super tiny forces, his law needed an update. For those super small forces, Milgram proposed a new equation. F equals ma squared, divided by some constant to keep the unit straight. The idea is that for very low accelerations, this squared term makes the force term extra important. Now, there's a catch. This new equation doesn't take medium forces into account, which is a bit of a gap. But hey, Milgram was laser focused on this galactic rotation mystery, so maybe it's okay to leave some details for later. The big picture is what matters, right? Of course, future scientists can delve deeper into the specifics. This theory, put forward by someone we'll call the theorist, is actually called Modified Newtonian Dynamics, or MOND for short. So, the verdict on MOND. It's pretty good at predicting how galaxies rotate, which is a significant achievement. First, the good news, Mond's ability to explain galactic rotation, as observed by Vera Rubin, was a game changer. Back in the 1980s, before we ruled out explanations like gas clouds or unseen black holes, Mond was even seen as a rival to dark matter. However, there were hurdles. Not only did Mond remain silent on modifying Newton's law for medium forces, but it also clashed completely with Einstein's theory of relativity. It was a clear mismatch. This was a challenge, but not a dead end. In 2004, Jacob Bekenstein, a Princeton-educated physicist at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, proposed a relativistic version of MOND called TVs, standing for Tensor Vector Scalar Gravity. It's a complex theory, but it aimed to modify Newton's law in a way that aligned with both MOND and relativity. Since then, other scientists have joined the quest, offering alternative contenders to Bekenstein's theory. Many of these new takes on M on D remain viable options. That, in a nutshell, is the current state of affairs regarding proposed modifications to Newton's law of motion. The search for a more comprehensive explanation continues. Experimenting with leading theories on dark matter. Tweaking Einstein's theory of general relativity is a whole other beast. There are countless ideas floating around. Physicists, ever the creative bunch, have proposed various modifications. Now we could dive into each one and tell you if they're still contenders, but that's a rabbit hole we won't go down today. Why? Two reasons. First, there are just so many theories. Second, not all their predictions have been experimentally verified. So let's take a broader look at some general tests that could apply to any theory tackling the dark matter mystery. All right we have two main contenders for explaining the dark matter puzzle. The first one is dark matter, an unseen type of matter that only interacts through gravity. The second is modified gravity, a revision of the laws of motion or gravity itself. Is there a clear winner based on observations? The answer, well, it depends on who you ask. But many scientists lean towards dark matter as the stronger candidate. Believe it or not, some of the most convincing evidence for dark matter comes from galaxies where we wouldn't expect to find it at all. Most galaxies spin far too fast for the amount of visible matter they contain, according to our current understanding of physics. This is where dark matter comes in. It's the invisible ingredient that explains the extra gravity needed for these speedy rotations. However, astronomers recently threw a curveball. In the late 2010 s, they discovered a class of galaxies that rotate exactly as predicted by regular physics 
with no hint of dark matter. This seems to contradict the whole modified gravity explanation for galactic rotation, right? If modified gravity explains fast-spinning galaxies, then why wouldn't it apply to these new ones as well? It's a bit confusing. On the other hand, imagine dark matter as a cosmic fog, patchy and unevenly distributed. It's possible that these newfound galaxies reside in regions with very little dark matter. This would allow them to rotate normally, according to Newtonian physics. Galaxies seemingly devoid of dark matter might be the strongest evidence for its existence. How so? Because if modified gravity explains fast rotation, why wouldn't it explain slow rotation too? It strengthens the case for dark matter as a universal phenomenon with varying density across the cosmos. Another observation that strengthens the dark matter hypothesis is the bullet cluster. Billions of years ago, two massive galaxy clusters collided in a cosmic head-on. Galaxy clusters are complex structures. They contain numerous galaxies and are enveloped by a vast cloud of hydrogen gas, often exceeding the mass of the galaxies themselves. During such a collision, the galaxies themselves mostly sail past each other, relatively unscathed. But the hydrogen gas clouds collide and come to a screeching halt. So what do we expect to see after a cluster collision? Separated galaxies with a massive heated gas cloud in between, exactly what we observe in the bullet cluster. Now the key question, how would dark matter versus modified gravity play out in this scenario? There's a way to test this out. Astronomers can look at even more distant galaxies behind the bullet cluster. If modified gravity is true, we'd expect the gas cloud, where most of the normal mass is, to cause the most distortion in these background galaxies through gravitational lensing. However, if dark matter is real, it would pass through the gas and cause the distortion where the galaxies reside. And guess what? This is exactly what we see. Distant galaxies are warped by the mass of the galaxies in the bullet cluster, not the gas cloud. This is a strong argument in favor of dark matter. So based on the evidence we explored, scientists overwhelmingly favor the existence of dark matter. Remember that mind-blowing galactic rotation data? It strongly suggests something unseen is at play. While modified gravity remains a possibility, the evidence leans heavily towards dark matter. Can we directly detect this mysterious stuff? Is it hiding in our own solar system? Stay tuned, because even though we don't know what dark matter is, we're getting closer to figuring out what it isn't.